afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet met, my name is David Brown. I'm, I'm president of Massachusetts General Hospital. Happy to welcome all of you here today. I gotta speak a little louder because Gil can't hear me, sorry. So uh, I'm really uh, honored to welcome distinguished colleagues from the American Chemical Society and other very special guests who are here today at long last to pay tribute to Dr. Saul Hertz, who was an MGH thyroid specialist in the 1930s and 40s. Dr. Hertz discovered and refined the use of radioactive iodine for clinical applications. Somewhere in the basement of this building, this old building is the original hospital of Mass General, Dr. Hertz carried out experiments, achieving results that would forever change medicine. Dr. Hertz's daughter, Barbara, will talk more in detail about his career. But I do want to impress upon all of you the enormous impact of his work. What began as an investigation, a scientific inquiry into thyroid disease, widened into an entirely new field of nuclear medicine. Dr. Hertz's discovery was particularly compelling because it was the first instance of something we call theranostics, both therapy and diagnostics. Radioactive iodine can be used for both treatment and for diagnosis. Today, more than 10 million people in the country will undergo radioisotope treatment of various types, not just iodine, and more than 100 million people will undergo nuclear medicine scanning. Now, I'm one of those people. Actually, I had a nuclear medicine test this summer in, in that building behind us. We are very proud that the MGH was the site of such a game-changing innovation in medicine. And yet we must acknowledge that Dr. Hurst, Dr. Hertz has not received the appropriate and well-deserved recognition over the years, in part because of attempts to rewrite history and claim credit for his work. The true story was largely lost until Dr. Hertz's widow, Vida, and then his daughter, Barbara, took up the torch for him. And it's thanks to their efforts that we're here today. On behalf of Mass General Hospital, I thank the American Chemical Society. We're truly honored to be the site of this prestigious landmark designation under the Medical Miracles category. Some other examples of medical miracles are the discoveries of vitamin C, penicillin, and taxol. I understand this is, the only, this is only the second American Chemical Society landmark in Massachusetts, the other one being across the river, uh, honoring MIT's Edwin Land and his invention of the Polaroid. And you'll hear from Barbara and that MIT plays an important role uh, in Dr. Hertz's story as well. Before I turn the podium over to those who will tell you the remarkable story of Dr. Saul Hertz, I do want to recognize several people who are here to honor his work. The first, I had a chance to meet Dr. Matthew Vander Heiden, director of the MIT Koch Institute, who's joined us today representing MIT. Welcome, thank you. Uh, also uh, want to recognize and, and welcome leaders in the uh, in the thyroid unit, Dr. Hank Cronenberg, Dr. Gil Daniels. Uh, these, these two were some of my teachers going all the way back to my own training here at, at MGH. And I can't help but recognize John Herman, who is many things, but is also an MGH historian. So I'm not surprised that he is right here to take part in this. History taking That's right. He doesn't want to miss any of those. So uh, you'll be hearing more from Barbara in a few minutes, but I just want to thank you for your tireless efforts. Without those efforts, I don't think we'd be here to celebrate your dad today. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I'm really delighted to be here today. As Dr. Brown said, my name is Katherine Lee. I am a medicinal chemist by training. I work at Pfizer just down the street. But today I'm representing the American Chemical Society, where I'm a member of the American Chemical Society Board of Directors. It's my job to give a little bit of the history of the National Historic Chemical Landmark Award. So let me, let me teach you a little bit about that. And I'm happy to read some remarks from Dr. H. N. Cheng, president of the American Chemical Society. Dr. Cheng writes, it is a pleasure to honor and speak to you today as we celebrate the dedication of the American Chemical Society's newest National Historic Chemical Landmark. The American Chemical Society and its many thousands of members are deeply committed to communicating the value of science and the people who advance it in our everyday lives. That has never been more true than today when we're depending on science and medicine 
to help end the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. As part of its mission to communicate the value of science, ACS created the Landmarks Program 29 years ago. The program is intended to enhance public appreciation for the contributions of the chemical, so chemical sciences to modern life and to encourage a sense of pride to the field's practitioners. In order to be designated an ACS landmark, each achievement must be at least 25 years old, represent a seminal advance in the chemical sci sciences, three, and show a significant benefit to society and the chemical profession. To date, ACS has designated more than 80 notable landmarks across the country. Some of the previous designations have honored the invention of Bakelite, the world's first synthetic plastic, the discovery and development of penicillin, and contributions of such noted figures in history as Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, Rachel Carson, the environmentalist and author of Silent Spring, and George Washington Carver, an African-American inventor and educator. Through today's National Historic Chemical Landmark designation, we honor the doctors, scientists, and engineers whose foresight and dedication led to the development of a whole new field of medicine. Our part of the story begins in the 1930s with Dr. Saul Hertz, who was then chief of Massachusetts General Hospital's thyroid clinic. At the time, scientists had recently begun producing new radioactive isotopes. Dr. Hertz realized it might be possible to make iodine radioactive and to use the radiation it, it releases to diagnose and treat diseases of the thyroid because this gland accumulates iodine. With Arthur Roberts, a physicist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Hertz began experimenting with radioiodine in rabbits. Then, in 1941, they administered the first treatment to a Massachusetts General Hospital patient with thyroid disease. Dr. Hertz later used radioiodine to diagnose and treat cancer. These advances and discoveries by other researchers laid the foundation for the modern field of nuclear medicine. Radioiodine and other radiopharmaceuticals are now routinely used in diagnostic imaging and treatment of disease, saving and improving the lives of millions of patients, quite possibly including you. In closing, I'd like to note that this is only the second National Historic Chemical Landmark in Massachusetts. As was mentioned by Dr. Brown already, <laughs> the other landmark celebrates the development of Polaroid instant photography and is located nearly two miles away from here. In both cases, these noteworthy achievements show that chemistry truly is part of our everyday lives. Thank you and congratulations. I'd like to publicly thank the American Chemical Society, Sophie Rovner, who so carefully reviewed the primary sources that document Dr. Saul Hertz as the originator of the medical uses of radioiodine. She lasered in on, the, on Dr. Hertz's work in radioiodine and its impact on worldwide health. The first memory I have of my dad is from a wedding picture that hung on my bedroom wall. I would not have recognized the Phi Beta Kappa key that he wore that day or its significance. More than 70 years later, I have come to appreciate his work, challenges, and his profound legacy. My mother carefully stored boxes of his original work. This treasure trove held the verification of Saul Hertz's paradigm-changing contribution a seminal medical discovery of the 20th century. Curiously, his name and or his contributions had been missing or twisted in the medical literature. I truly appreciate this ACS award that clarifies the history and provides inspiration. His journey began on April 20th, 1905, as the son of European Im Im immigrants who raised their seven boys in Cleveland, Ohio, as Orthodox Jews. 
He, gra he earned his Phi Beta Kappa honors from the University of Michigan in 1924. His graduation from Harvard Medical School was at a time of strict quotas for outsiders. His internship and residency were completed at the Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland's east side that was built to accommodate the needs of e the east side Jewish population. In 1931, Mass General's Dr. James Means, who was instrumental in establishing the thyroid unit here at Mass General, appointed Dr. Hertz as the director of the clinic, where he served as such until 1943. It appeared that Dr. Means must have been somewhat open-minded and that he encouraged the first woman to come to MGH. All right, we have the first picture here. Hold on here. <laughs> okay. A medical eureka moment occurred on November 12, 1936, when Saul Hertz, along with Dr. Means, attended a luncheon meeting at Harvard's Medical School, Vanderbilt Hall. The speaker was Massachusetts Institute of Technology, President Carl Compton. President Compton's topic was what physics can do for biology and medicine. And mind you, this was only one year after the Nobel Prize had been given for artificial radioactivity. So timing is everything. Dr. Hertz had been investigating the effect of iodine on the functioning of the thyroid, seeking an alternative to surgery to remove the thyroid at that time was often dangerous and expensive. Saul Hertz solely conceived and spontaneously posed the pivotal question, could iodine be made radioactive artificially to MIT's President Compton? False information regarding Hertz's question to President Compton, as well as other aspects of his contribution, have repeatedly been cited falsely. Hertz's MIT collaborator stated, it was Hertz who conceived the idea for both research and therapy. Your conjecture that it was the outcome of a group discussion has no basis in fact. Dr. Means in a letter is quoted as writing, it at once occurred to Hertz that we could make use of them to solve a problem we were already working on, documenting that Hertz solely and spontaneously asked Compton the pivotal question. Um, it was time for a selfie. There was no social media back in the day. And this is, he must have known something important was going on. In 1937, Harvard fund, funded the Hertz and Roberts' first series of experiments with four dozen rabbits that utilized iodine-128. MIT physicist Arthur Roberts created I-128, as reported by Enrico Fermi, without a cyclotron, using a radium beryllium neutron. The non-cyclotron I-128, with a short half-life, was administered to the rabbits with altered thyroid gland functioning. Quantitative analysis showed that hyperplastic glands retain more iodine than normal glands. These studies demonstrated the principle that RAI as a tracer could be used to investigate thyroid physiology. Hertz and Roberts co-authored the article describing their findings. MIT's radiation lab director, who had hired Arthur Roberts, learned that the paper was ready for publication. He reminded Roberts that as a condition of Roberts' employment, that the director's name be added to the paper. The lab's director dictated a letter for Hertz to sign that the publisher add the director's name to the author's list, although he had taken no part in the construction of the experiment, analysis of the data, or writing the paper. After the publication of the article, Hertz's colleague, Maya Soli, wrote to Hertz from California asking to copy the Hertz-Roberts rabbit studies. Hertz wrote back, welcome aboard. 
1938, using the University of California at Berkeley's cyclotron, Glenn Seaborg and John Livingood created I-130 and I-131 with a longer radioactive half-life. A cyclotron was needed for MIT to make a longer lasting RAI to do clinical trials. MGH's Dr. Means secured $30,000 from the Markle Foundation to build MIT's cyclotron. That was quite a deal, don't you think, back in the day? <laughs> Means reported to the Markle Foundation, my former house officer, Mayor Soli, is working on radioactive iodine. Hertz and Roberts deserve a great deal of credit in getting their pioneer work done without a cyclotron. As soon as the cyclotron here is available, we can progress rapidly having the groundwork done. Saul Hertz rushed over the Charles River Bridge with radioactive iodine produced in the MIT Markle cyclotron on March 31st, 1941. Dr. Hertz administered 2.1 millicaries of the MIT cyclotron produced REI, establishing the very first therapeutic use of REI. The patient, Elizabeth D., was here at the Mass General. A Lugol solution of stable iodine was used to prevent the patient from having a thyroid storm. She was given a second dose and ultimately had surgery. Her thyroid did shrink, and it was documented that the RAI was taken up, her, up by her thyroid. Thus, proof of concept was established. Gradually, the first series of 29 patients was developed. Hertz and Roberts continued to treat hypothyroid patients throughout 1942. Hertz and Roberts were the first and the foremost to develop the experimental data uh, and use it in the clinical setting. So in less than five years, Dr. Hertz went from posing his question to an effective, safe, and enduring treatment meeting with success. Anyone who's done any clinical work or research combination knows that five years, no computer, little notebooks, this is pretty outrageous. Also, in 1942, it's important to note that Dr. Hertz conducted limited clinical trials using RAI to treat thyroid carcinoma. Through the magic of technology, Dr. Saul Hertz is here with you from an old radio program from WEEI. It's a very short clip, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to hear it, but I'll give it a shot here. He spoke of his success in treating hypothyroidism, and he seemed hopeful of using RAI to treat thyroid carcinoma. In early 1943, MGH granted him a military leave of absence to join the United States Navy during World War II. Hertz felt that his cases had been well established and that meticulous analysis with regard to the protocol was in place, having used medical dosimetry in designing an effective and safe therapy. A private practice doctor who treated affluent patients worked part-time at MGH. Hertz asked him to take over his cases. Hertz had firmly established the work. Arthur Roberts speaks to Hertz's replacement, commenting, I would believe nothing on this subject from him who bungled, whether deliberately or not, the follow-up on Hertz's original series when Hertz joined the Navy. Yes, the protocol making little use of dosimetry and use of a standard large dose was administered to 22 new patients that were developed by Hertz's replacement 
and MIT's lab director. They submitted their paper to the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, before Hertz returned from the war. The editor of JAMA contacted Hertz, sharing with him, I have a paper here from MGH and MIT regarding radioactive iodine, and your name isn't even on the paper. What's going on here? Morris Fishbein, the editor, asked Hertz and Roberts to write up their seventh paper on the medical uses of RAI. Two articles appeared side by side in 1946 issue of JAMA with two teams from the same institutions with the Hertz Roberts article first. Chairman Emeritus of MGH's Department of Radiology, Dr. James Thrall, comments at his MGH Museum presentation in 2016 that basically Hertz's work was stolen, the most flagrant, unethical, academically reprehensible behavior. Worse yet, Saul Hertz died in 1950, and a great deal of time and effort was spent rewriting history. Okay. It appears that a setback was really a setup for something far-reaching and enduring. After the war, Hertz joined the staff of Boston's newly expanded Beth Israel Hospital. He writes, my new research project is in cancer of the thyroid, which I believe holds the key to the larger problem of cancer in general. It's at the Beth Israel Hospital with a grant from the Navy that Dr. Hertz continued to develop and refine the RAI therapy for treatment of thyroid carcinoma. Using Hertz family money in September 1946, the Radioactive Isotope Research Institute was established with the mission of applying nuclear physics to medical investigation, diagnosis, and treatment. New York Montefiore's Hospital's Dr. Samuel Seidlin was the associate director. By happenstance, Dr. Seidlin had explored the use of REI to treat cancer with a patient known as BB at New York's Montefiore Hospital who arrived with metastatic thyroid cancer. Years earlier, patient BB's thyroid had been surgically removed. After consulting with Hertz, Seidlin treated BB with REI. Amazingly, BB's metastases responded to the RAI. No new lesions appeared, and some completely disappeared. However, BB died from anaplastic carcinoma. This is a polite way of saying it. Economic pressures made it difficult to create change within the profession. The headline, $3.40 goiter cure, involves orange juice, iodine isotope, gives you some insight. Surgery to remove the thyroid produced lucrative fees for the hospital and surgeon. I found hundreds of patient letters with the same theme. I'm not in the money. How can we get it? I can't afford an operation. There's, there was no insurance in the United States, and patients were desperate. Hertz was determined to use radioactive substances to diagnose other organs than the thyroid, furthering the pushback by the establishment. The headline reads, Hertz to use nuclear fission in cure for cancer. The article stressed the tracer-targeted approach. He advocated for the government to distribute RAI off of the atomic pile by being active with the Atomic Energy Commission, who released RAI prepared at Oak Ridge. This made for wider uh, distribution and lowered the cost. Hertz stated, here's another incredible quote, Demand is expected for radioactive iodine, and as research develops in the field of cancer and leukemia for other radioactive medicines. Recently, Dr. Richard Baum, a world leader 
in radiomolecular precision oncology stated, we owe a debt of gratitude to Saul Hertz for conceiving and bringing to fruition the medical uses of radioiodine that has served as the foundation of Theranostics, which forms the basis of radiomolecular precision oncology. Dr. Hertz's paradigm-changing work revolutionized the diagnosis and treatment of disease that has been inspirational for leading scientists towards controlling cancer and extending the lives of cancer patients worldwide. All right, this is a famous iconic picture of Dr. Hertz doing an uptake test. And the equipment in the background here is a multi-scaler. You know, they didn't have much equipment back in those days. These basically Geiger counters. Um, and this was his assistant, Doris Darby. She probably didn't realize that she would become so famous. But this multi-scaler that was developed at MIT um, is an iconic demonstration of the uptake testing. It also helps us to appreciate dosimetry for a safe and effective dose, biomarkers, preclinical studies, the integration of the scientists, sciences and collaborative teams, as well as the research clinician model that have all endured. In 1949, Dr. Hertz established the world's first nuclear medicine department at the Massachusetts Women's Hospital. In, 19, in July of 1950, he passed, leaving an indelible impact on endocrinology, oncology, neurology, cardiology, radiology, and most importantly, countless generations of patients worldwide. Gail Devers, an Olympic athlete who was treated with the RAI and who triumphed after her treatment, winning medals in 1992 and 1996, sent me her photograph. And I think it's a nice way for me to um, end the presentation. The inscription reads, in memory of Dr. Hertz, thanks for all your work, dreams do come true. Thank you. Uh, I'm here not to praise Shaw, but to tell you a little bit about him as a person. He was a real, live human being. He had feelings, the same as we all have feelings, but he was in constant conflict with the money producers of the hospital the surgical department of every hospital was the, was the primary source of the money that the hospitals needed to, say, operate with. And so was advocating a chemical solution. So had created enemies within the medical world that were the most powerful, and that is the surgical teams. All believed that there were chemicals that could be used for treating thyroid. And at the time that I met him, that was his specialty. He was taking money away from the pockets of the surgical, because who in their right mind wants a scar on their neck? They don't. So if you have your choice, if you had your choice between surgery and chemistry, you'd have chosen chemistry. But Saul was a believer in chemistry 
for cancer. And so was in constant conflict, not only by because of the thyroid situation, but because he was advocating chemistry for soft tissue cancers. Not just the thyroid. And, and he was not allowed to treat patients. When I knew him at, at Beth Israel, unless the patient was declared inoperable. Then he was allowed to use chemistry. Okay, she wants me to tell you about the book. So identified with Tom Paine. The, when I met Saul, he, inter he interviewed me in a manner that I was completely unaware of. He asked me questions about my likes and dislikes, what I learned in undergraduate school and stuff like that. I don't know why. I don't know why. I was there as a lawyer, not that way. And so, but I told him what I thought. And apparently he liked what he heard from me. And so he gave me a copy of this book. Citizen Payne. He identified with Tom Payne because Tom Payne, as you all remember, was a magnificent writer espousing the American Revolution. And then when he left the country and he went to France to aid France in its revolution, wanted to come back, they didn't want him back in the country because he was a radical. They, and so if he liked you, he gave you this book. The book is unique because A, it talks about Tom Paine, the radical, and it was written by Howard Best, another radical. Howard Best, as you some of you may remember, was one of the Hollywood 10, the, the screenwriters who were blackballed in the industry. So I was given a copy of this. She managed to get her own copy, but I don't this know what good. happened to my copy. This is Joe, good. I just want you to know, he was a human being with a one-track mind that I don't know how the hospitals really could put up with, with him. Because what he believed in today, today he would be jumping up and down with joy because his theory of treating cancer by chemistry is today's standard. And so I think that he deserves a plaque. He deserves to be memorialized. Welcome to the dedication of the American Chemical Society's newest National Historic Chemical Landmark, Salhurst and the Medical Uses of Radio Iodine. We heard about Dr. Salhurst's seminal work in harnessing radionuclides to treat thyroid disease and thus give, giving rise to the field of nuclear medicine. This landmark, is, this landmark designation is significant on many levels. It recognizes an early and effective example of using chemistry for improving human health. It is an excellent example of interdisciplinary scientific collaboration, in this particular case between a physicist and endocrinologist, and the collaboration between two research institutions, Massachusetts General Hospital and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It was innovative. The radioactive iodine treatment that was developed was a radical departure from uh, standard treatments available at the, at the time, 
which usually involves thyroidectomy or destruction of the thyroid tissue by x-rays. Unlike radioactive iodine therapy, these approaches were expensive, dangerous in a time before antibiotics were routinely used, and carried a real pot potential of damaging healthy peripheral tissues. I would like to pick up at a more recent point in time. In 2019, when I was chair-elect for the Northeastern section of ACS, I learned that our section was serving as the co-sponsor along with um, nuclear, uh, with, uh, nuclear uh, chemistry for, um, for the Saul Hertz uh, radioiodine therapy landmark um, nomination. The nomination was in the process of being approved, and once approved, we could formally begin planning um, for the designation event. It quickly dawned on me that this would likely be the most important activity during my tenure in the chair rotation of our local section. The landmark designation piqued my interest and excitement from a professional standpoint. As a chemist who spent uh, more than a decade at McLean Hospital developing um, potential radio label diagnostics and medications for neurological applications, I deeply appreciate the brainstorming, inspiration, excitement, hard work, and successes of fruitful collaboration between scientists and clinicians to advance discoveries to viable, useful medical applications, as was accomplished by Saul Hertz. I'm also painfully aware that the individuals um, behind this work generally go unrecognized for their efforts. Unfortunately, this also happened to be the case for Saul Hertz for a very long time, as his daughter Barbara Hertz discussed. Thankfully, we are able to convene today to correct this historical slight. The most well-known patients of radio, uh, radioactive iodine therapy in recent history uh, were Barbara and George Bush, who had their hyperthyroidism treated uh, with the atomic cocktail over 30 years ago. It is remarkable that RAI therapy, which was first administered 80 years ago, still endures as first-line treatment for this condition in, in uh, humans as well as animals. Um, the achievement we are celebrating today is a result of one gifted individual's ingenuity, tenacity, and meticulous scientific investigation translational development, rationally merging elements of chemistry, physics, and medicine to afford the first diagnostic, the first targeted cancer treatment. It has launched a broad field of nuclear medicine that clearly has a positive impact on people's lives today. The individual we are celebrating is Dr. Saul Hertz. I wish to thank everyone who worked hard to um, make this ACS National Historic Chemical Landmark official, especially Barbara Hertz, um, Saul Hertz's daughter and steward of his archives, and Sophie Ravner of the ACS Landmarks Committee, who um, worked diligently to, uh, to see this designation through. And thank you all for joining us in this celebration today. really quickly for you all. So, a National Historic Chemical Landmark for Medical Use of Radio Iodine, Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston. Shortly after scientists first produced new radioactive isotopes, Saul Hertz, MD, Chief of Massachusetts General Hospital's Thyroid Clinic, realized it might be possible to make radioactive iodine to treat diseases of the thyroid as this gland accumulates iodine. Hertz and, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology physicist Arthur Roberts, PhD, began experimenting with radio iodine in 1937 and administered the first treatment to a Massachusetts General Hospital patient on March 31st, 1941. Hertz later used radio iodine to diagnose and treat cancer. These advances and discoveries by other researchers laid the foundation for nuclear medicine. Radio iodine and other radio pharmaceuticals are now routinely used in diagnostic imaging and the treatment of disease, saving and improving the lives of millions of people. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you so much. So treatment with radioactive iodine knocked the thyroid cancer, metastatic to a little bit of bone and lung, right out of me, exceeding my doctor's expectations. I'm now 81. We have a large family. Many were praying for me. The cure delivered on the wings of prayer was Dr. Saul Hertz's discovery, the miracle of radioactive iodine. Few 
can equal such a powerful and precious gift. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and celebrating. And more, import and more importantly, for all the work that you do in keeping this um, important approach to treating human, diagnosing and treating disease going.